Good morning. I'm Dusky Terry, president of ITC Midwest. For the third straight year, we are pleased to be the presenting sponsor for the Iowa Ideas Conference and extraordinarily proud of our partnership with the Gazette. As an electric transmission company serving two thirds of the state, ITC Midwest is invested in and has a very real stake in the future of Iowa. We've supported this conference since its inception because we embrace its mission of gathering hundreds of Iowans together to explore the key questions and the big ideas that will shape the future of our state. ITC Midwest was formed in 2007 to improve electric transmission reliability and increase transmission system capacity in Iowa. And we followed through on that commitment with more than $4.1 billion in capital investments to date. Our investments in the system not only serve the changing needs of customers, they also provide additional capacities to support economic growth and development of low cost renewable energy resources. Our investments have resulted in a 62% drop in transmission related outages since ITC acquired the system and began operating it. From extreme weather events, such as last year's derecho, to the unprecedented transition to renewable energy, from the rapid adoption of electric vehicles to the increasing focus on energy system resilience, the electric utility industry is suddenly in the national spotlight. All of these forces reinforce the critical role of the transmission grid to support the changing landscape and ensure consumers have access to low cost, clean and reliable electricity. You know, we often talk about at, here at ITC about the power of connection, meaning connections are needed to deliver power to communities. There's also tremendous power when people connect to solve problems. Over the next couple of days, I hope you will engage in the breakout sessions, speak up during discussions, and share your ideas to create a brighter future. Open your mind to different points of view as we all work together to come up with the best solutions for making Iowa an even better place now and in the future. I want to thank you for your participation to help shape the future and wish you a great conference. So welcome. This is uh, this is the fourth year in, on Iowa Ideas that I've uh, hosted a water quality panel, and we we have yet to solve the problem. But let's uh, let's give it a, a, one more try today. Uh, I'll make some introductions. We've got Chris Jones, who's the who's an IIHR research engineer at the University of Iowa, one of the leading voices and researchers on water quality in Iowa. Maybe give us a wave, Chris. There he is. Uh, Mike Schmidt is a staff attorney with the Iowa Environmental Council. Mike, hello. And John Norwood is a, is a Polk County Soil and Water Conservation Commissioner elected in 2018. Welcome. Uh, I think we'll, you know, we'll dive right in since we've only got an hour and this is a big issue. Um, one big story at the confluence of uh, water quality and drinking water this past year was the Des Moines Water Works struggle to handle algae toxins in the Des Moines River, uh, one of its two surface water sources. Uh, of course, the algae blooms are, are fed by nutrients and a lot of those nutrients are uh, running off cropland. Uh, John Norwood, you're, you're a Polk County water drinker. Uh, maybe you could just give us a brief synopsis of, of what happened. Well, what, what happened in terms of the um, microtoxins is that uh, uh, the Des Moines uh, Water Works, essentially, I think your, your viewers would, it would be uh, helpful for them to understand that uh, Water Works can draw from two river systems. It can draw from the Raccoon system and the, uh, the Des Moines River system. And uh, so uh, what happened with the recently is that the Des Moines system has been impacted uh, by microtoxins, which are byproducts of the algae uh, in the water and specifically probably from Sailorville Lake. And so that has knocked out half of the water supply for the city of Des Moines. Uh, they can't use the Des Moines River for, for stretches of time, particularly when the algae are active and the, and the microtoxin blooms are present. It's a very difficult toxin, as Chris Jones can probably tell you, to remove from, from, the, from the drinking water system. So, so unlike nitrogen, nitrates in the water, which can be essentially scrubbed out, the microtoxins, we do not have a good solution for that. So that, that's essentially one of the problems from a, from a systems perspective that we need to begin to look at. How do we manage uh, our water supply, source water supplies? And so my commission, 
is very interested in uh, systematic approaches, and I'm happy to talk more about that during this hour. Sure, great, thank you. Uh, and it wasn't just Des Moines, Chris. You you wrote earlier this year about uh, Ottumwa, which also has surface drinking water issues. And and you, in writing about that, you also talked about how socioeconomic factors, including race, can uh, factor into a community's ability to deal with that those pollutants. Uh, you kind of ran afoul of a Republican legislator who who wasn't crazy about your your arguments. But maybe you could kind of tell us uh, tell us what you uh, what what a Tumwa situation is and, and what you've found about it. Well, Tumwa uses the Des Moines River also and has for many years, and and the river is impaired for nitrate down there too, and. You know, unlike Des Moines, uh, Ottumwa, you know, it's one of the poorest communities in the state. Um, you know, I think it's 700 and something out of 900 communities in terms of median income. Wapalo County is also at the bottom of the, the, the state in terms of a median income. And so I've been down to their treatment plant a couple of times. It's old. Uh, depression era type uh, facility um, and they have some real infrastructure needs down there and so that's a community that you know faces a lot of problems with both with their water and wastewater and of course you have a lot of immigrant labor in Ottumwa working at the the JBS um, hog processing facility and then you know upstream we have you know wealthy I mean, let's just face it, wealthy white guys, older white guys uh, <laughs> that are the source of the pollution, whose, you know, average income is three times that of the average Iowa. And so, uh, yes, there are social justice issues connected with water quality here in Iowa that, <clears throat> you know, the political body does not acknowledge or even attempt to do anything about. Were you surprised by the pushback on that? Well, um, so actually, you know, people in the legislature read my blog and uh, one particular individual said that I could talk about anything except uh, environmental justice. And if I did that, uh, somebody would get upset about it. And so me being who I am, that was pretty much an invitation to start talking about it. And so... <laughs> So uh, I wrote that essay, and um, sure enough, somebody took offense to it. Uh, Mike Schmidt, uh, we've had this nutrient reduction strategy on the book since 2013. It lays out some pretty good science on how farm runoff is, is uh, mainly responsible for the nitrates and phosphorus flowing into waterways and, and prescribes some, uh, some uh, measures, but those measures are voluntary. Uh, uh, and are still voluntary. How, how's that? How's that working out? Well, it's uh, it's not not leading to very much change on the ground. Um, IEC has done analysis of how much progress we've made since the nutrient reduction strategy uh, was adopted as as the state policy, and uh, the the pace that we're on would would get us to uh, I, I guess achieving one of the the options uh, or the scenarios that the nutrient reduction strategy lays out uh, in about 22,000 years um, based on uh, the analysis that, that we did uh, earlier this year. So it's it's not a, a time scale that I think most people would would hope for. Um, I mean, none of us will be around by the time that, that we get to that point unless we change the way that we're doing things. So the the nutrient reduction strategy does not really have a, a defined end point. It doesn't require anything of non-point sources, basically agricultural sources. And we've tried the voluntary approach for decades. We've been been doing that since the, the Dust Bowl, so for the last 80 years or so. Um, and our, our water quality is not getting better. So we're, 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 we're not getting enough volunteers, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, there, there have been instances where, uh, you know, cost chair money has basically been returned from the, the Raccoon River watershed because they couldn't find enough volunteers or they were worried that there wouldn't be any volunteers, so they gave the money back. 
Um, and so that I, I think exemplifies the, the problem we have with the voluntary system. Yeah, and the, and the, and the you know, lack of, of regulatory uh, steps. Uh, mm -hmm. Chris, you've, you've been outspoken on what you think needs to be done to, to make the strategy more effective or to, or to put a dent in the, in the water quality problem. Maybe you could tell us what your ideas are. Well, first, I would say the science assessment is fine. So the, the science team did a, an, um, an evaluation of the literature and quantified what practices would work. And, um, and you know, so we know uh, that the practices that are in the nutrient strategy will work. Um, like I always say, if you're going to have a voluntary strategy, you need volunteers. And so, you know, even with co cost share, you know, those aren't volunteers, we're paying them to do it, right? Uh, at least part of it. And so what can we do to bring uh, people um, to the table to adopt these things? And, you know, farmers aren't any different than any other people. They're human beings. And so they are going to act in their best self-interest. And so, <clears throat> um, you know, we're, if we're going to depend on the altruistic instincts of, of these farmers, I mean, forget it. It's not going to happen. I think we're kidding ourselves. Um, and so we're all not driving Priuses, right? We're all don't have solar panels in our house. And so, you know, they act just like the rest of us. So we need something to compel um, farmers to change what they're doing. And so what is that? Um, you know, is it laws? you know, which I think we need some laws uh, to govern what's happening out there, but do we need some economic drivers as well? And so we probably need both. And, you know, let's face it, this system is designed to provide cheap commodity grain to large corporations uh, that also um, want to sell stuff to the farmers. So something about that whole scheme has got to change if we're going to get the environmental outcomes that we want. But yes, we need laws. It's painfully obvious that we need laws to govern uh, this system. We really don't have anything right now. <clears throat> and you've uh, you've got five, I believe it's five proposals that you think would would help. I've I've heard those, but maybe everyone out in the audience hasn't. So the low hanging fruit, we've got, uh, we farmed 400,000 acres in the two year floodplain in Iowa. Why are we doing that? It's insane. Every other year, the inputs on those acres are gone to the Gulf of Mexico. So that's one. Secondly, we still allow uh, application of manure to snow and frozen ground. We do have some guidelines, but if we have a severe winter and there's snow on the ground in March 1st, there's manure on that snow on March 2nd. And so all that nutrient and material and the manure gone to our stream network. The third thing is we need to rework the uh, master matrix um, livestock siting uh, regulations. The manure management plans connected with the master matrix allow and endorse an over application of nutrient to fields. And so consequently in watersheds that are live, uh, livestock dense, we have enormous amounts of nutrient being applied and those are our worst streams. Uh, we need to ban fall tillage. Iowa State University has been putting out guidance on fall tillage since 1980 saying that it's bad. Uh, fall tillage increases erosion, it increases nutrient loss. Why do we allow that? It's insane. The last thing is we need to require farmers to adhere to Iowa State recommendations for nutrient application. And so we know statewide, even the Iowa Agribusiness Association will tell you this, statewide we overapply nitrogen probably 20 to 30 percent. So how on earth do we ask the taxpayers to pay for these edge of field treatments to capture the excess nutrient that's being applied while at the same time we give farmers license to apply however much they want. It's the dumbest policy on earth, but our politicians just will not uh, embrace any of this. 
And like I said, that's a low hanging fruit. The hard stuff is getting half the state and cover crops. How the hell are you going to do that if you can't even do the easy stuff? Okay. Uh, John, I know that you, uh, you see things a little differently. And I guess just if you wanted to tell us about the approach that, uh, that Polk County is, is taking. Yeah, let me, let me wind the approach because the approach is down at the tactical level. And really what, what we, need to, we need to do is we need to start at the vision level. You know, we got to get away from the name calling and the, the, the bad actors. And we got to get, we got to, we got to find a, a way to get people to come around a new vision for Iowa agriculture. As Chris Jones just spoke about, we have a 50 year plus vision that's all about output. It's all about production. You've heard, many of our viewers have heard, you know, we're, it's our job to feed the world. Well, I would argue, actually, we need a new vision that is really more about sustainability and resiliency. So if we just focus on output, we're, gonna, we're, we're not going to have a sustainable system. We've already lost a third of our topsoil. We, we have you know, responses, a system that uh, is, is now increasingly uh, susceptible to flooding. And uh, water quality issues. This is all, these are all indications of a system that is out of balance. It's not resilient, it's not sustainable. So what do we do? We start with a new vision for building that sustainability and resiliency. And part of that means we have to take the 23 million acres that we grow to corn and beans, and there's probably 10%, two and a half million acres, there's a higher and better use than growing corn and beans. And so Chris Jones mentioned the 400,000 acres down in the two-year floodplain. We should not be subsidizing growing corn and beans through something we call crop insurance, which down in the two-year floodplain is akin to flood insurance for corn and beans. We shouldn't be doing that. Let's give the uh, farm operators and the landowners, we got to distinguish those two groups. They're not the same people, uh, another option. And they do want other options. So from the vision, we, we then go into the strategy and you, you referenced the, uh, the so-called nutrient reduction strategy. That's not really a strategy, that's a menu. And in order to get to a strategy, what we need to do is take that vision. The strategy is something that takes the vision from, from fantasy to reality. And the strategy then needs to have the resources the prioritization and a way to measure what we're doing. Uh, and so when, when we combine those things into a strategy, then we get down to the tactical level. Some of the things that Michael Schmidt is trying to do with his organization up at the legislature. But frankly, we do a lot of this backwards. We go up to the legislature and we say, hey, we need to make a few changes here and there with really out without understanding the big picture first and getting both you know, Republicans and Democrats, they're, 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 they're all good people. We're all trying to do the right thing. But if we don't have consensus on the vision first, we're really not going to get anywhere very quickly. And so what we did in the, at the tactical level at Polk County is I said, why are we doing saturated buffers? It's an edge of field solution. It's a, it's a filtration technique one at a time. You can't solve anything here with 23 million acres one at a time. You have to take a systems approach. So we rethought the delivery and the marketing of how we do that. We don't wait for a volunteer to show up at the door saying, hey, I want to do something. We actually proactively go out and we target and we come up with a new delivery system. And so we've gone from one at a time to 50 at a time through a first pilot. And then we're going to go to 100 at a time. This is the saturated buffer. But the same approach is applied, should be applied to our heavier green infrastructure, something we know as wetlands. We have 1,600 of those that we need to do that will cover about half of the 23 million acres. And so we have to apply systems thinking and teamwork. But it, but it all starts, Todd, with the vision, getting people to buy into the vision of what we're trying to do and why. How do you get farmers and landowners to buy in? I mean, I... There's been polling that shows that a pretty significant number of farmers don't feel like agriculture is responsible for the water quality problems. Uh, there's some disconnect yeah. between the science and, and, and public yeah. opinion. So yeah. what do you what do you do? Yeah. So so you know we, we talk a lot about uh, those in, in college and school and in, in, in the communications. You you talk about audience. 
who is your audience? Know your audience. And one of the first things we need to, we need to stop doing or we need to recognize, this happened with our <clears throat> Polk County project I just described to you. A staff people were telling me, you know, we got to go find some farmers. We got to go find some farmers. I said, what, what's a farmer? They said, well, the farmer, it turned out the farmer is the person driving the tractor. Well, half the time, the person driving the tractor doesn't own the land in Iowa. In fact, I think it's higher than that. So uh, some of the strategies we need to employ have to do with making changes to the land. And so the equivalent would be like going to somebody who's renting a house and saying, hey, we want you to paint the house. And the person looks at you kind of funny and says, well, I don't even own this house. I'm, I'm just renting it. You want me to paint it? So we got to understand who are we talking to? Are we talking to a farm operator? Or are we talking to a landowner? And we have to understand how do we make it in their financial interest? A big part of this, if you want to ask yourselves, how did we get to where we are today? You just need to look at the financial drivers. A lot of the financial drivers come from Congress. So if we want to change the outcome and the results, we need to change the drivers. And a lot of the people that I've spoken to, farmland, farm, farm operators, ag landowners from around the state, they really want to have more options than just growing corn and beans. That, that is a very difficult game. You just need to look at the historical prices. So that's, that, those would be my suggestions. Understand who is the audience. And then secondly, and Chris mentioned this, economic drivers, we got to understand what the drivers are to each of those parties. They're not always the same. Uh, and how do we, how do we find win-win situations? But the, this would involve, I mean, your approach would involve some public investment in, in these measures matched somehow. Is that where my yeah, uh, well, it's 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 right before us right now. I mean, Congress is debating a trillion and a half infrastructure package, and I would argue that uh, a big part of the 23 million acres, 14 million of that is tiled, six to seven million of that is controlled by something called a drainage district, which is co typically controlled at the county level. And we're talking about basically hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in infrastructure, green infrastructure. These wetlands I talked about would be one example. Uh, the other aspect, which is an ongoing subsidy through the farm bill is the crop insurance. That is the second largest entitlement after food nutrition. We spend billions of dollars insuring through crop insurance, some of the 23 million acres, the federal government, you and I pay for 60% of that premium. And to Chris's point, and this has been made by others, Larry Weber and others, uh, there's, there's certain areas, we have 400,000 of two year floodplain. We also have highly erodible areas. And there are other areas we, we need to identify. And, and I think we should just say, uh, make some changes to the, um, to, to, to where it, the crop insurance can be applied. And, uh, and then we won't, we won't, the farmers will be, the landowners will be incented to do other things. And at the same time, don't just take away the benefit, provide another option. So, you know, CRP ground would be, you know, some of this should be perennial and forest land and then recognize what's happening with climate change, the carbon markets. And the carbon markets are also applying standards to uh, particularly when it comes to soil health for fertilizer applications. So Chris is right. We need to also pay attention to the amount of fertilizer that is being applied both, you know, anhydrous and urea and the animal forms of manure. But we need to look at it from a systems perspective and an economic perspective. If we do that, we, you will be surprised how quickly I think Iowa farmers they are a very industrious lot. We just need to give them the financial signals uh, and help them make some of these changes. Chris, uh, what, do you, what do you think about that approach? Well, certainly we need more crops. And I mean by that more, you know, third and fourth crops other than soy, corn and soybeans. We all know that. Um, if you want to get them to grow something else, you know, quit incentivizing them to grow corn and soybeans. And so, yes, crop insurance is a factor here, but we also have, you know, built infrastructure that, um, you know, supports that activity. 
as far as the wetlands go, the 1600 wetlands um, and CRP and so forth, I mean, the land is in high demand in Iowa. I mean, that is just the facts. I mean, land prices are going up again. I think this last year was maybe the record increase for one year. People are not going to retire land unless, you know, we require them to do that. Young people want to get in the want to get into farming. They can't get into farming because they can't get the land. And that's one reason we have these floodplain acres that are farmed. And so we need laws. We need laws. If, if everybody's going to insist on growing the corn and soybeans, and I tell you, they are, we need laws to sort of rein in that activity so that we get the environmental outcomes that we want. You know, they, these farmers might be industrious and they might be uh, ingenious and, you know, all these other uh, adjectives you want to say about it. But the truth is, you know, a lot of them are millionaires. They're really wealthy guys. They're making three times as much as the average Iowa. And a lot of this grain farming now, it's not that hard. They're only working a few weeks out of the year. And so why are we continuously asked to subsidize and indemnify this activity and then to pay to remediate the, the pollution? It's insane. So let's first address that. Should there be another vision for food production in the United States and for agriculture in the United States? Yeah, I agree that we need that. But that's a solution that's going to take decades and decades and decades to get to. You know, if we want clean water next year or five years from now, we need to do things now that are going to do that. And so, you know, I'm not satisfied to sit around and wait for a new vision to take hold, hold across 80,000 Iowa farmers. You know, that's not going to produce uh, good water quality anytime soon. Um. Mike, uh, Congress was mentioned, but you know Chris is mentioning potential state laws. Uh, the The Supreme Court has basically decided to stay on the sidelines of this issue. They they wouldn't let the the Food and Water Watch and Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement lawsuit go forward. Uh, I mean, you you spend some time at the Capitol, I I think, and and uh, you know, is there is there any hope for action under the under the golden dome of wisdom? Uh, I, I think there's a little bit of hope, but not not a lot based on the last couple of years. Um, you know, IEC has been supporting uh, funding the trust, the uh, outdoor uh, recreation trust fund, and um, that, that's something that Iowans supported overwhelmingly in 2010, but has has not been funded. So it provided a constitutional amendment for uh, for funding when the legislature raised the sales tax, but because it has not done that, we have not gotten that funding. Um, so that that doesn't address the kind of regulatory side, but that would provide funding to do more water quality testing, assessments, um, potentially funding good practices. Uh, Minnesota has done this and has has kind of turned a corner and is improving its water quality in its eleven thousand plus lakes and and many rivers and streams. Um, from the regulatory standpoint, I, I think I, I am not very optimistic that we will see progress at the legislature uh, soon. I think I, I agree wholeheartedly that we need a regulatory side and an, an economic incentive to get this to change. But the regulatory side, I, I think, is very difficult right now uh, to see in the, in the near term. Um, I think there are definitely reasonable things that need to be done, and including the ones that, that Chris mentioned. But we have been trying to do that uh, as IEC and have not been able to make much progress on that for many years. Well, let, me interject, let me interject here, Todd. Go ahead. So, yeah, I know that you know the likelihood of regulations being passed are low. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But people need to talk about these things. Uh, we have, uh, we, we are unwilling to stigmatize the bad things that are happening on the landscape. 
And the way to do that is to start talking about potential laws. And so if they want to do fall tillage, okay, defend it, make them defend it. If they want to apply, uh, over apply nutrients, okay, make them defend those things. You know, and the way you do that is by talking about laws. And so, you know, we have a real trepidation about stigmatizing these bad practices. And so consequently, when we stay silent on those things, it in effect becomes an endorsement. And so we, we as a state, uh, we endorse these things that are doing that are bad for our water. And one way to stop endorsing it is to start talking about laws and the people that are doing those things, let them start defending what they're doing. Uh, I was going to ask you, Mike, uh, the, the governor had the bill a couple years ago to fill the, the trust fund, although a lot of it was replacing existing funding and the funding that was going for water quality was basically going to the, into sort of status quo stuff that we're doing now that's not really measurable or no one's really held accountable. They just, you know, receive funding for various practices. Do you, do you get a sense that, that that's coming back or is that, you know, is filling the trust fund not really on the, on the agenda? I, I don't think we've gotten indication that the, the governor plans to reintroduce it. So I'm not sure that it's on the table, but I, I think it should be um, uh, along with the other the other things, like like Chris said, we do need to have this conversation as a state, including at the at the legislature, about how are we going to deal with this because the the approach we're taking right now is not working. We need to do something different. Other states have have taken action. Um, I I used to work in Minnesota, and they've done a number of things like requiring buffers along streams, and they have a, a groundwater protection act that is potentially leading to regulation uh, of 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 agriculture in areas where groundwater is being polluted. So there, there are regulatory steps that other states have been able to take. And I think we do need that, that conversation beyond just funding the trust, uh, which, which is a step forward, but not adequate by itself. Right, how did, how did uh, I'm sorry, did someone have something? I was just gonna ask how in Minnesota did uh, the, did state government, the legislature, the governor overcome? I'm sure there was opposition from farmers to those measures. How did they, how did they get, get past that? Well, they, they had a, a governor who uh, basically announced that he planned to, to do this and, uh, and then tried to get people on board with it. And, uh, and there was definitely opposition, but they, they had a split government and, that forced some negotiation. And uh, in addition, Minnesota had had a longstanding requirement that was not necessarily enforced to require buffers along streams. So there was already significant compliance and they, uh, you know, they, they didn't have that many people who would have to change very significantly. Whereas I think in Iowa, we, we don't have that requirement. We don't have that, that split uh, politically, and so I think it's it's a very different circumstance here compared to trying to overcome a, a smaller number of objections and objectors uh, in in the state. And, and we don't have the governor using her her bully pulpit to say we need to address this, we need to take action now to prevent some kind of catastrophe down the road as as water quality continues to worsen and we have a drinking water crisis. Todd, I'd, I'd like to add to that. I, I think Minnesota's got some good, <clears throat> some good, some good leadership. There are, there are two, I think, fundamental factors though that are a little bit different for Minnesota. What, and, and, and one was there, there, there were economic drivers coupled, coupled with the buffer protect, protection, the financial drivers. Uh, and, and so that was part of, part of the solution. And the, the demographics of Minnesota are a little bit different. They, it's a state of, I think, uh, Michael of about six million people, six seven million people, about twice the size of Iowa's three point one. So their urban core has has a little bit more uh, wields a little more power, and then and the financing mechanism I think is is supported by that that difference. But <clears throat> to Chris's to Chris's point, I, I I guess I disagree a little bit. I don't think I I think we certainly need to talk about 
uh, you know, different opinions, different ideas. I have lived here for 20 years and, and I feel like I've had a lot of personal examples where diversity of thought is rejected. So we have to figure out how to, how to bring different ideas and, and talk about them. But I, I, think, I think actually spending a lot of time right now uh, trying to focus on law passing laws and regulate regulation first, that's not going to work. That's not the historical, that's not the recent history of, of this state. And so we need, we need to recognize, I believe, the way, the way to begin to drive change, that new vision is put the dollars behind it. So you asked Chris about his, his priority list. My first priority list would be placing the guardrails around what kinds of land are eligible for some of things like crop insurance. Uh, we ought to modernize and weatherize our ag plumbing system using system thinking. We have 3,600 drainage districts. That's our plumbing. That You want to talk about how does the nitrate and the animal, the hog, hog manure get into our waterways? It's through those, through those tiling systems. We need, to, we need to modernize them and weatherize them just like California and Texas are doing doing with their electrical grids. We need, we need to do the same thing. And it's, it's a huge investment, 100 billion plus in those drainage districts over the past 100 years. The third thing would not be- not public uh, property. <laughs> what's that? Those drainage systems are not public property. Well, what the conveyance, I think, have been paid for privately. And I think the things, what I'm talking about, Chris, the wetlands and the things we need to add to those systems would be public property or would have public entitlements. The third thing is allowing uh, the local, uh, empowering our local infrastructure, organizational, the soil and water districts that I'm part of, uh, and hold them accountable to lead the conservation planning. This stuff shouldn't be led at the state level. It should be led at the local level. And the final thing is recognize the power of the carbon markets in the emerging ecosystem markets to establish standards. That's kind of what Chris is talking about, but I'm coming at it from a different perspective. Let the market help drive those standards for things like fertilizer application. It's already happening. We just need to harness ourselves to some of those market forces. Well, and, yeah, and one, of the, one of the audience members asked a question about, you know, whether consumers could potentially uh, demand. They already are. You know, play they a already role. are. Well, and that's what I want to ask is that we've, you know, we're in a situation where uh, demand for electric vehicles is rising. The automakers are committed to making electric vehicles. 60% of the state's corn crop goes into making ethanol. And if we have electric vehicles, we're not going to need <laughs> ethanol or fossil fuel. Right. Uh, you know, you've got preferences changing in, you know, in people's diets, uh, you know, I've heard stories of folks in, in the Great Plains growing peas and legumes and things for all of the, the new meatless products. So do these big changes in the way we farm that may be on the horizon, is that going to be the moment where we can, we can uh, you know, see some change in environmental protection? Chris, I'll let you have first crack at well, that. Certainly the ethanol, the electric electrification of the auto industry is going to be a big factor. Some years, as much as 60% of our corn goes to make ethanol. And so that's an area of land the size of 20 Iowa counties. And so, yes, we should be thinking about what we're going to do with that land. Um, will the industry figure out uh, new markets for corn? I guess it's possible. Um, you know, there is a large demand for meat here, both in the U.S. and the uh, and the world, and so uh, meat consumption in the United States is increasing, and and so you know who knows what's going to happen as you know electric cars begin to take over the market as they apparently are going to. Um, but I will say back to this drainage issue: um, if public dollars are used to upgrade drainage systems in Iowa. We need our heads examined. These are these were paid for with private dollars. It's on private land. If the taxpayer is going to pay farmers to help them drain their land, I'm telling you what we we have things we have our priorities really mixed up 
And that's what I'm talking about. You got the city of Tumwa down there. Can't afford nitrate removal for their water treatment plant. We don't want to give them any money to help with that, but we want to give money to farmers, improve their drainage, which causes the nitrate problem in the first place. It's insanity. The drainage, the drainage districts, I think, are fundamentally key. And I would agree with Chris that the conveyance part, the movement of water, uh, the drainage function is something that would continue to be a private, privately funded use. That's how these drainage districts are funded. It's basically like self tax, a uh, tax on on their uh, on their acreage on the on the on the uh, collection of the water. But we fundamentally need to realize, I think, recognize that drainage is just one of many functions we need these 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 districts these state charter districts to perform i would think of them the vision ought to be water management and by water management drainage is one function water filtration is another uh, aquifer recharge is a third flood storage is another they have they can perform public functions and so the investment the public investment in the drainage districts, Chris, is to transform them to be water management districts. And so that's where the wetlands and the other functions come in, the missing functions, including habitat, uh, you know, uh, pollinate, pollinators and so forth. And so we, we got to get away from, Chris, I think just shooting at people. And we, we got we to gotta give people a direction they want to move towards. And we got to listen to other people. We can't just fire at people in blogs and expect people to to want to participate so we have to be fair the first thing we have to do is to be fair and so we have downstream users of the water resource in des moines in Atumwa, and other places that are expected to endure this pollution and endure the impairment of their drinking water sources and their um, recreational waters to me, that's not fair. And, you know, we've tried this engagement with farmers now for half a century. And where has it gotten us? We have toxic algae blooms in Des Moines. We have nitrate impairment in Ottumwa. We have beaches closed all over the state. We have, you know, 700 and some impaired water bodies. And so, you know, I would ask, why do we want to continue doing the same things that we've done for half a century, which is trying to engage these farmers and have them voluntarily adopt things? Well, I think I think you're you're you know to me your language is part of the problem. The way that you're speaking right now, <laughs> and I think if you want to get people to uh, to participate, then you have to start with the vision. You have to treat people with respect. And frankly, we're not doing things as we have for the past 50 years, Chris. The three years I've been on the Soil and Water Commission, we've made some fundamental changes to how we do work, which I described earlier, which is systematic approaches. That's what we need, Chris. Systematic approaches, not one at a time. So are people in Ottumwa being treated with respect? Are people in Des Moines being treated with respect? And Des Moines Water Works has used the Raccoon River as a drinking water source for 74 years. They just announced a couple months ago that they're abandoning the Raccoon River as a source because of lack of progress uh, in cleaning it up. And so, you know, this has got to run two ways here. We have public health issues, um, you know, with Iowans that don't farm. The Iowans that don't farm aren't polluting the water of the Iowans that do farm. And so we have fundamental fairness issues here. We have social justice issues here. And so it's fine to engage farmers. I, it's fine to treat them with respect. But, I mean, let's not ignore what has happened here. In Iowa, I, I would I would agree I would agree we have a water quality problem. There's certainly no disagreement on that, and I, I think you would probably find not too many farmers if you went and you went up to some of the, the upstream counties, for example, and spent some time talking to those people as who have as as have I. Uh, uh, people, I think, though, are looking for solutions, and so I, I haven't heard anything about abandoning the Raccoon River. 
Chris has a water supply. Well, you haven't think, been reading the news very closely. I, I, I think I think maybe it was a national story. The Des Moines River. You're talking maybe the Des Moines River. I think you might be referring to, but the Raccoon River is is part of our critical water supply here. I am not. So mistaken. I think I think it is. Okay. I, th I think <laughs> I think they're both they're both important rivers. We don't want to abandon either of them, and we need to take systematic approaches to how we improve the infrastructure and how we improve the soil health that are going to result in those improvements in water quality. Okay. Well, I definitely I, am not mistaken. The Des Moines Water Works, it's an AP story, a national story. The Des Moines Water Works is abandoning the Raccoon River as a source of drinking water. Google. Well, that's the, that's what the, that's the lawsuit that the Supreme Court didn't want to take on was, was about the raccoon and the failure to to uh, keep it safe for drinking water. Uh, so we, we talked about the potential for electric cars to, to potentially, my, my dog wants to get in on this. I'm not <laughs> uh, <laughs> Electric cars, uh, changes in, in consumer attitudes. Uh, you know, what, what about this uh, carbon sequestration that we're starting to hear about? The governor's got a task force uh, does that have any potential for uh, ushering in uh, environmental protection improvements or, or you know, the, I guess the basic question is, does it help with climate change or, or, or would it just be simply another resource, another public resource for agriculture to tap? I don't know, Carrie, Mike, I don't know if you have thoughts on that, if the environmental councils have been following that issue. We've, we've been following it a little bit, but we've not been heavily engaged on it. Um, I think from our perspective, the, the science is not entirely clear on how, how much you save by changing practices, um, but clearly our, our current approach of over-fertilizing corn and beans is not good for the climate or for water quality or a number of other things. Um, so we, we do need some changes. Things like cover crops can, can provide multiple benefits and shifting from, uh, from corn and beans to perennial crops things like that can, can definitely provide additional benefits. Um, I think we, we do have some concern that the carbon markets and, and this approach could just be, as, as you put it, another, another way to, to tap into public resources. And uh, there's potential for misuse or for the system to be set up in a way that doesn't provide the benefits that it, that it could or should. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of the things in the farm bill were not originally designed to, you know, lead to nitrate pollution, but that is the consequence based on how, how they've ended up being used. And so as we look at carbon markets, we need to be careful about how we set up those markets so that we don't end up with the same kind of side effects or abuses down the road. One of the things I'm excited, excited about, Todd, it was a story in the Wall Street Journal this week is now the recognition of the importance of methane as a climate uh, uh, greenhouse gas. It's 20 to 25 times more potent than, than carbon dioxide. And agriculture is a major source. And we, as Chris Jones has pointed out, we, we raised 50 million hogs here in this state a, a year, a third of the nation's pork and most of that manure. I've, I've done work in this field, but no, I know a little bit about it to be dangerous. But most of that manure is stored in pits underneath the, uh, the barn, and then it gets spread once a year, uh, typically in the fall, uh, out on the land. And then depending on what Mother Nature does, a bunch of that might end up in a stream and a river in our drinking water supply. Well, if we can figure out systematic approaches to capturing that methane by treating the manure, all sorts of interesting things start happening with anaerobic digesters. Now you have... Uh, pathog pathogen control. You capture the methane. You can use, do useful work with that. You uh, control odor. You stabilize the nutrients for soil health. There, there are many different things that could be beneficial. Uh, the carbon going into the soil is something we need to, to focus on here in I Iowa. We had a, a, a system for 50 years that's depleted soil carbon uh petroleum based and we need to kind of we need to shift our thinking as to what we're doing there and that, that's beginning to happen uh, but i also wonder why it is you know you think about kodak you think about blockbuster 
uh, leaders in industries at their time, uh, they were not the ones, Kodak didn't lead the digital camera, uh, uh, Blockbuster didn't lead streaming. And so we're, we're kind of waiting around in some respects for the, for the existing players to, to come up with new things, new vision. And so I think that's part of the challenge is to, to talk about, put together this new vision. And you're right, Todd, electric vehicles are gonna come on strong. And we're going to have a lot of ethanol. Maybe we'll need it. Maybe we won't. But in the world of business, we call those stranded assets. And it's very hard to pull ourselves away from stranded assets. But we need to do that. We need to think about how do we, how do we reimagine those assets to do, to do new things? Well, on the carbon markets thing, I'm not a fan, I think. <clears throat> The things that have been proposed uh, can very easily be reversed um, by the farmers, you know, doing certain practices. If we want them to pay something, then we should be paying them to do something with permanence, like planting trees would be the best thing. Um, soil health is not going to be a solution for our water quality issues. We have some of the best soil health in the world right now. Yeah, it's degraded, but it's still, you know, better than about any place else. And we still have, you know, bad water. And so the soil health uh, things, it's, it's intuitive and it's fine. Um, they're not going to improve water quality. And I don't think the taxpayer should pay farmers to do it. The digesters, uh, can make sense in some situations. And so they're common in Europe and Denmark and the Netherlands. But um, I can tell you right now, mark my words, the hog industry is going to use the digester concept to expand. And so, and they're going to want the public to pay them to put in these digesters and uh, that's going to enable them to increase the number of hogs here and it will not be a solution to water quality. It very likely will not be a solution for air quality. Now, does that mean digesters are bad? No, but I would just say, be very wary of using public money to, to pay farmers to put these things in. Well, and I think it's been, it's been reported that the legislature is pretty reluctant to even consider regulations for the digesters. I think they're uh, you know, that's, at least that's what you read. I don't know, Mike, if you've, if you've sort of followed that. I have not followed that closely, no. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, we, with a lot of the stuff we, you know, we've heard about the barriers that we, we hit and one of them, you know, the legislature and Congress, that it's, there are political barriers. Uh, and one of the reasons for that, it, it seems to me is that, while this is an important issue for most people, it's not one of the big issues. Voters just aren't making decisions on this issue in a, in a lot of cases. How do we, you know, how do we make voters, you know, care more about this? I mean, what what is it that would would bring it home to? Because it seems like it's a it's an environmental versus agriculture debate. How do you bring the public into it? This is in part. I think it's. It's a human health issue. Our, our system, uh, as it's currently set up, is, is exposing us to a variety of risks. We, we, we're going through a pandemic, and we've had a, a couple of, pan, of animal pandemics. Uh, and, and in part, we have a system that, we're, for example, we're managing all this manure uh, that uh, puts, it at, puts us at risk. You look at our waterways in terms of the antibiotic resistant bacteria and so forth that, in, that are in the water. So the human health, I think, is, is an important part of this. And, and then I think also uh, national security from, from, we have a system right now, an agricultural system that is so dominated by corn and beans and hogs that we, uh, from a trade perspective, put ourselves at, at tremendous risk. We're asking China, basically we have a system set up to feed China and China may or may not want to use our system, depending on what's happening politically on the given day or month or year. And so I think that goes back to the idea of 
if we don't want to have farmers at so much risk and landowners, ag landowners, we ought to figure out how to diversify the system to do other things and not be dependent on, you know, one principal buyer. Chris? Well, we have some uh, water resources in Iowa that are uh, worth uh, preserving and that are, do still have some integrity. And those are primarily in Northeast Iowa. And so when you look at the state and you look at our streams, uh, most of the stuff in Western Iowa is in really bad shape. And I used to hate it when people would say this, but I, I think a lot of these tributaries of the Missouri River, it's not worth spending public money there. The streams are too far gone. They've been straightened. They've eroded downward. Um, they have no integrity from any perspective, hydrologically or from a water quality perspective. And so, you know, we all know our public dollars are always limited. So where should we spend that? And I would say Northeast Iowa. And so you go to Northeast Iowa, we still have some streams there that look pretty decent. Upper Iowa River, the Turkey isn't too bad. Um, Yellow River isn't terrible. And so let's spend some money up there and turn that area into a real tourist de destination for the rest of the state and something that state can be proud of and care about and go there uh, to enjoy, you know, the natural world. But a lot of these rivers, uh, I'm telling you, they're not coming back. Um, it's going to take another ice age to bring them back. And so I really think we need to identify what's best here, what remains that's best, and then do our best to protect that. And for Iowa, that's Northeast Iowa. Well, and it would seem like the Bloody Run Creek situation has become sort of a rallying cry for that Northeast Iowa protection argument because that's that's one of the outstanding waterways in the state and they're going to put 11,000 cattle in its watershed. I mean, the industry's telling the state something, right? If, if they're willing to put 11,000 cattle at the headwaters of Bloody Run, I mean, when somebody tells you something, listen to them. They're telling us, you know, they're going to take it if they can. And so when they tell you that, believe it. Mike, what do you, what do you think about how to get Iowans to, to, to care more about this, this water issue? I, mean, I guess the beach closures get attention when you find out that your Saturday is ruined. <laughs> Things like that. I mean, that's kind of where it comes home. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's one one angle, you know, coming coming from Minnesota, Minnesota has a, a culture of enjoying their waterways and their lakes, they have so many and many of them are clean. And so people across the state, all value them. And and I think in Iowa, we don't think of ourselves as having a lot of lakes, but we do have a bunch of lakes and uh, the, the beach closures do affect people who, who, you know, want to go and enjoy uh, the outdoors and enjoy the water. And uh, so I, I think building that that recreational base and uh, that that cultural value for clean water is is one way to to do it. And uh, you know maybe that's improving Northeast Iowa where we have those clean waters, the the water uh, Des Moines water trails project is is another angle that people are taking, IEC. Uh, publicizes the beach closures to help keep people safe. Um, and, and then I think the other aspect is, is drinking water, which everybody is concerned about and which is increasingly a problem. Uh, you know, that's, that's partly why we have this panel today. Um, and it's, it's both the public water supplies that are having to pay a lot of money to protect people and keep them safe. It's also the private water supplies, private wells, where we have tens of thousands of private wells in the state that uh, have, have unnaturally high nitrate levels, high enough that they are likely contributing to more cases of cancer. We have thousands of wells, private wells that have tested above what would be the drinking water standard uh, under the Safe Drinking Water Act if that standard applied to private wells. Uh, it's, it only applies to public water supplies, but we have thousands of wells that exceed that, that limit. Um, so I think drinking water safety is, is one that people 
really care about personally and knowing that their their drinking water is at risk uh, is, is something that really resonates with people uh, no matter where you are. Right. Uh, we've, we've, and we've seen, I mean, record park usage during the pandemic as people want to get outside and maybe they've they've come in contact with water quality in a more personal way than maybe they had in the past. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes. I'm going to let each of you just, if you got anything you want to say at the, at the close, any more thoughts you want to get off your mind? I'll start with you, Chris. If Well, um, about everybody knows what I think these days. And so <laughs> I, mean, well, I don't really need to say much else. I, I want water to be better. Uh, you know, I want farmers to be prosperous, but I don't think the public should have to pay to clean up this pollution. And so. Okay, John. Yeah, I, I think this is, thank you so much for having the panel today, first of all, Todd. Uh, I think we can solve this issue. I, I think if we get everybody rowing in the same direction, I think farmers want more options, more choices. Ag landowners too, I'm hearing in the conversations. And I would echo what Michael said. I think our water, drinking water quality, it's a statewide issue. And we ought to be super concerned about what's in the water. The, a lot of the regulation is, is from the 1980s and, and, and early 2000s. And there's a lot of stuff in our water at low levels that we don't really understand what the long-term impact of drinking that water is. So those would be my, my closing thoughts. Okay, quickly, Mike. Yeah, we, we need to, to change the way that we're doing things because otherwise things will keep getting worse. And so that, that means changing the regulations to get people to actually do things differently and changing the economics so that it can work for everybody. Well, thanks to all of you. This, is a, this was a really good discussion. I enjoyed it. Uh, the next session on the energy and environment track starts at 1030. It's carbon sequestration and the future of ethanol, which I think we talked about a little bit. And uh, uh, Aaron Jordan will be moderating that panel. So that should be a good one. So thanks to you all and uh, appreciate your, your time and thoughts. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Thanks.